Today's topic is flake attributes and debitage analysis. And right away, I'd like to thank two people, Andrewski, the author of our textbook, and you'll see this reference cited at the end of the show, and David Rigtrip, one of our former graduate students, who supplied me with a wonderful PowerPoint lecture that has helped guide me in creating this one. What is debitage? Well, my long-term definition was always flakes versus shatter. Flakes, meaning predictable pieces deliberately knocked off a rock during flint napping, and shatter, meaning unpredictable pieces accidentally knocked off a rock during flint napping. Andrewski, however, who is a lithic expert, considers debitage to be all the non-tool and unused artifacts from flint napping. <clears throat> he uses the word shatter only in connection to flakes, proximal flakes versus flake shatter and he calls the rest non-flake debitage. Why examine debitage? Well, it's often the main record of activity at many sites, particularly at pre-ceramic sites. In flint napping, only 9% of stone raw material may become the finished product, and 91% is likely to become debitage. Thus, debitage may be the most abundant kind of artifact at a site. Debitage is useful for characterizing the kind of technique used. Was it bipolar percussion, percussion flaking, pressure flaking? And it's useful in characterizing the technological strategy of a society. Curated for mobile lifestyle, expedient tools for a sedentary lifestyle. And debitage can aid in assessing how a site may have functioned. However, biases exist in debitage and stone tool analysis. Most American debitage and stone tool analysis focuses on bifacial tools, and many analyses focus on mobile, pre-ceramic hunter-gatherers. However, bifaces characterize only a portion of a lithic assemblage. Expedient, simple flake tools and unifaces constitute a large portion of stone tool assemblages. You might ask, when is a piece a flake and when is it what I've called chatter? Well, previously, I've said that when a piece has any two of the attributes of a flake, it is a flake, even if it's just a fragment. Andrewski, however, points out that if the piece has a recognizable dorsal attribute and a single recognizable ventral attribute, you should call it a flake. I've previously shown you this illustration from Whitaker of flake terminology, and you should learn these attribute names and places. So for example, the striking platform or point of percussion is at the proximal end of the flake and is visible on the ventral surface. Termination is at the distal end. Flake scars and cortex may be visible on the dorsal surface. Andrewski divides flakes into two categories, proximal flakes and flake shatter. A proximal flake has a discernible point of applied force or the striking platform. A proximal flake may be either a complete flake or a flake fragment. Flake debitage with no recognizable striking platform constitutes a flake shatter, and these are always fragments. Or as I call blocky fragments without recognizable ventral and dorsal surfaces shatter, he calls them non-flake debitage. I'll begin talking about flake attributes by talking about flake termination, that is how the distal end looks. Flint nappers are aiming in general to create a flake that ends with the feather termination, that is a smooth termination that gradually shears off. I like this photograph over here because the feather termination is so thin, it's translucent. Whereas overshot flakes, outre passe, also called plunging flakes, um, are hit so hard that the bottom of the flake comes around and curls around to the other side of the rock from which the flake was knocked. In a step termination, the flake has snapped to form an almost 90 degree angle with the ventral surface. 
When you find this on a flake, it's difficult to tell whether it happened during flint napping or whether it's happened after a flint napping when the flake was lying on the ground and someone stepped on it. However, when you see flake scars like this, um, you know that these flakes had step scars at the point of flint napping. A hinge fracture instead is rounded on the end, as you can see here. This illustration shows both a step fracture, 90 degree angle, and a hinge fracture, rounded. Flake shatter can happen at any point, either during flint napping, when the flake breaks as you're hitting it, or later after deposition. If you need to measure flake count, the only reliable method is to count the proximal flakes. Some analysts identify debitage conditions simply as broken versus unbroken. Or you can go further and identify the broken flakes as either proximal, having the uh, striking platform, medial, or distal. You can't tell the difference between medial fragments with step fractures and distal fragments with step terminations, and thus all such fragments would be called medial. Striking platform variability has been used to determine the type of hammer used, the type of piece being modified, the stage of tool production, and the size of detached pieces. Here I'll illustrate just four generalized platform types, cortical, which has cortical uh, cortex on the uh, striking platform, flat, complex, which has many different facets, and abraded. And of course, these may be combined, so you may have an abraded complex platform. Other measurements of platforms might include the platform angle, the facet count, and the platform width and thickness. Depotage size. Analysts generally believe that debitage size relates to size of the piece from which it was struck. And this in general holds true, but not completely. However, in general, flakes do get smaller as you progress through the steps in the reduction process. In measuring size, you may measure the length, the width, the thickness. However, as you can see in these illustrations, that can also be complicated by measuring width at various points and thickness at various points. Flake size class. One way to derive flake size class is to sieve your flakes through screens, usually one half inch, one quarter inch, and one eighth nested screens. One problem with this, however, is that if the flake is on the diagonal or if it's uh, lengthwise going down the skinny end down, um, you will not get accurate measurements. So a more accurate way would be to place each flake on a circle to measure it. In this one, it fits with this flake fits within the one inch, but is bigger than the half inch. Therefore, it's graded at half inch in size. Another method is to divide length by thickness or weight. In talking about dorsal cortex, Andrewski appears to group together what I defined as cortex with patina. Regardless, the amount of cortex on a dorsal surface is used to indicate the reduction stage. You can express the amount of cortex as a percentage or a simply present absent. Andrewski scales the cortex into four ranks from zero, no dorsal cortex, to three, the entire dorsal surface is covered in cortex as it is in the bottom right photograph. Some researchers examine dorsal flake scars. They might count the flake scars themselves, which is not an easy task, or they might try to count the number of dorsal ridges left behind. It's thought that these may relate to the stage in, re in the reduction sequence. So what do you do with all of these attributes and the measurements and the ways in which you might measure them? We can define three basic approaches to debitage analysis, an attribute-based analysis, typological analysis, and aggregate analysis. Most debitage analysts do experimental flint napping themselves in order to track the changes in flake attributes. 
Let's start with attribute-based analysis. This is based on the idea that depending on the particular flint napping technique used, flake attributes change in patterned ways. And paying attention to the particular attributes allows the analyst to properly characterize the assemblage. You can track changes in flake attributes to characterize an assemblage by recording the striking platform morphology, the dorsal surface morphology, presence and absence of cortex, raw material types. People who criticize attribute-based analysis point out that it may be time consuming, that the measurements and recording can be subjective, that it's not reliable. Why? Because researchers differ in both definition of attributes and how to record them. A second set of analyses are typological analyses, and we can define three of these. Triple cortex typology, in which you classify flakes as either primary, secondary, or tertiary, based on the amount of cortex left on the dorsal surface. In technological typologies, you classify flakes as diagnostic of a particular type of technology or technique. For example, a biface thinning flake, such as illustrated here, or a plat striking platform preparation flake. In application of load typologies, you classify flakes based upon what hammer type was used. For example, hard hammer versus soft hammer percussion. This also can be subjective, time consuming, and a lot of variation from researcher to researcher. Little standardization exists on how to record attributes thought to be diagnostic of particular flake types. The third type of analysis I'll talk about, and this one was new to me until David Rigtrep talked about it, is aggregate analysis. Two types, one mass analysis, where you use non-technological attributes, therefore no necessarily knowledge of these, how to measure in these types of attributes, using things such as aggregate size and weight distributions to characterize assemblages. However, these are often combined with a single flake attribute, usually the percentage of dorsal surface cortex, versus minimum analytical nodule analysis, where you partition your assemblage by the raw material types in order to reconstruct so-called nodules, doing virtual refits. While aggregate analysis is considered to be both objective and replicable, and a type of analysis that allows you to process large samples quickly, especially if you simply screen the samples through nested sieves, it's not a good method to use when you have mixed assemblages. It's also susceptible to error based on your field recovery methods. For example, if you used one half inch to screen the dirt at your site, obviously then you cannot separate out one quarter inch and one eighth inch sizes of flakes or debitage. For the best results, you should combine analytical methods, and it's better to record as much information as possible in order to make more robust interpretations. David Richtrup recommends that the minimum attribute set to record should include size of flakes, weight, striking platform type and condition, dorsal surface condition, presence and absence of cortex, and flake completeness.